Okay, so thanks again for joining us, folks. Our speaker today is Sherry Russell. She is a lecturer in the Landscape Architecture Program at the University of Maryland College Park. She is currently teaching there about urban agriculture. She's also the principal of Russell Design Workshop, which provides design services for residential and commercial clients, and they specialize in edible landscapes and native plant palettes. When she's not teaching or designing, she's very happy to play in her own gardens with more than 1,000 square feet under vegetable and fruit production at her home and in a community garden. We'll also share her email address in the chat at the end of the presentation so that you can contact her after the presentation if you'd like. So with that, Sherry, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for such a great introduction. And I am so excited to see we have so many people online. And this is a topic that's so near and dear to me. And I could literally go on all afternoon. But we're on a timeline here. And so I'm going to try and keep it to the sort of concise, get it going, um, top tips and design um, advice that I can give you in terms of vegetable garden. And I did see that the survey that was available, that we have a lot of very experienced uh, gardeners here. So I'm uh, very excited about that. And even the most experienced of us, myself included, can always pick up tips here and there. So I hope that everyone will um, be able to take away some things from this. So as Stephanie mentioned, this is a fall garden design evaluation. Is it time? to um, either design a new one or redesign the one you have, but it is definitely a great time of the year to think about this. So my story is I've been growing for 12 years at home and in the community garden in Montgomery County. I'm about 90% vegetable self-sufficient. Now, let me put a little caveat on there. When you start growing your own, you tend to eat more of what you grow and what's easy to grow than it is, um, that you're having everything you ever wanted. So no, I'm not growing ginger or turmeric, for example. They're kind of tough to grow here. Not impossible, but kind of tough. But otherwise, about 90%. Um, I have a master's in landscape architecture and an MBA. And I teach urban agriculture at the University of Maryland and College Park in the landscape architecture program that Stephanie mentioned. And I have a private residential design practice, um, also with some commercial clients as well. And we specialize in um, landscape, uh, edible landscapes. So why is garden design important? Really good design ultimately needs less work. The first year, maybe not after you design it or redesign it, but thereafter, it's just a lot less work. And it also maximizes your possible growing space. And, you know, I am um, have to admit that I used to have an attitude of more is more, but when it comes to um, growing, I have come to realize that more is not necessarily better. Um, what's better is to really maximize what space you do have that's prime an ideal space. But the results are clear. These are all things that I have grown um, and not in one year. Every year there's something that does very well and other years are um, other things. So um, these are different things that I have grown in the past, but it's, you know, they're not just pretty to look at, they're pretty darn tasty as well. So let's get to it. Um, top four design rules. And these are from my experience and with clients. Um, and these are the areas where I find I get the most effective um, design by focusing on these four top areas with people that I'm actually designing for or even for myself. And so hopefully with these four, you'll be able to um, maximize and do your um, design yourself. So my very first rule that there is in this is you really need to garden in the sun. Now I know some of you are chuckling. What in the world? Of course you have to garden in the sun. Well. There's more specifics. Um, sunlight requirement for vegetable growing is really eight to 10 hours, ideally. Um, the more the better. Rooftop gardens are fantastic that way because they have unlimited sun usually. Um, but that's not our growing scenario for the most part. And 
we also have trees and we have houses and we have other things that are obstructions in our sunlight. So really at a dead minimum, six hours of sunlight is really required for um, efficient vegetable production. There are some things that you can grow in a five hour scenario, um, like leafy greens, um, cherry tomatoes, small refrigerator peppers, but that is, there's a real limit on that. Um, six plus hours is really your best. And then on top of that, your best sun is gonna be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the day. So if you have six hours, but it's from sunrise till noon, that's not the same as having it from 10 to three in that six hour period. So that's another thing to keep in mind that intensity will be a lot less if you are in the morning or in the late afternoon. Another thing to consider about the sun is that, as many of you may have already noticed, is that the sun is not in the same place throughout the year. In the summer, we can see here, I'll use this. In the summer, we've got this very high arc. This is not a great color. There we go. In the summer, we have this really high arc, but in the winter, it goes much lower much further in the southern horizon and it's much lower and in the spring and fall it's somewhere in between in there so what does this mean this means for us that as the sun is changing its location throughout the year we have to think about different possibilities um, in terms of where that sun is going to be available to us so if we were to put in this picture the garden behind the house, when the sun is lower in the horizon, we're gonna get shade in the, in the um, fall, spring, and definitely in the winter. And if your goal is all year round production, which in our location, well, I should say, in many places in Maryland, all, round, all year round produ production is possible with limited to no protection. Um, I think in further west, in the mountain areas, you're probably going to require some protection more for snow and ice, perhaps than drastic temperature changes, but it's still possible to grow all year round. Um, it's even possible to grow all year round in Maine. So uh, it is possible. So if you are thinking about all year round production, then you're definitely going to want to um, think about where that sun is going to be in the winter and make sure that you locate your garden in a place where it's still going to have some sun in the in the winter. So you've got your place and you're thinking this location is perfect. Now these pictures on the right, <laughs> I saw within the last week. Um, I'm going to assume that the person on the top photos their garden, um, they made a good effort, but clearly didn't realize that that very mature tree was there. Um, and that's clearly not a good scenario. And the one on the bottom, I'm gonna assume that that's a little mini greenhouse and they're using it in the very early spring for some uh, early starting of the season when the trees have not leafed out. And in which case it probably is in some sun, but certainly most of the year it's not. So um, the, the sun, shade and obstructions are really important to consider, and especially in our urban and suburban growing environments. So let's take an exercise and see if we can find a really um, easy way to try and identify um, where sun and shade and potential locations for your garden could be on your property. So simple exercise using Google Earth. So if you look up your property on Google Earth, um, you can learn some things from satellite imagery. This is an image of a friend's property, she was considering where can I put a garden in my yard? And so I went on Google Earth and I, I found this image of her yard and it's a little pixelated because it's um, low quality coming from um, Google Earth, but I've got things um, identified here. So the, in the first one here we see um, in the yellow, this is her property line. So we have some idea of the yard. And the next thing I wanna do is say, okay, where do we have all the hard surfaces. So in the case of this, where's the house, where is the driveway, sidewalk, etc. 
And so I've marked those on the next slide. So here we've got all the hard surfaces. She's got a driveway and, and a sidewalk coming up to the house. And then she's got a roof and a rear patio. So obviously hard surfaces are not a good growing condition um, with certain caveats. Um, it could be if you're gonna grow on your patio or such. Um, in this particular case, she wanted to grow on the ground. So um, we're going to assume that the hard surfaces were not a location in this particular example. So then after we've got the hard surfaces, look and see where the sun is throughout the year. Um, there is a really great website you can go to. It's called suncalc.org. It's listed on the bottom here. And you can put your location in and it'll give you this um, diagram. This is not from their website, um, but it essentially interprets their, their um, diagram for you. And you can see how in the east, so we're facing north here, looking up the top of the screen, and East here on the right side, uh, you see the sun comes up about eight, uh, six, or 6 a.m. and it goes all the way around till 9 p.m. And these are approximately where the sun is at those particular times of the day. And, and the lower um, arc here is the winter sun and the higher arc, if you can think of it in a 3D perspective, the higher arc is where the sun would be in the summer. So we can get some sense about how um, high in the horizon it is relative to this house and where we might see some shadows. And so from knowing the path of the sun, we're going to start to look for shadows. And we can see shadows here on this particular image. And if we look at the house here on the left, I see this area in here, for example, that's a shadow in the, Im in the um, Google picture. And so I know from this picture, and I, I also know from experience, that this, this image was taken at about nine in the morning. Um, so if it were taken at three in the afternoon, the uh, shadows would be on the opposite side here, over in here, for example. Um, but that's not, um, it's not so important. It's only important to realize that we have shadows that are gonna be projecting across from the images. So in this next one here, I have marked it. So I had, as I've shown before, I've got the house shadow. But the other thing that we can see from the previous image before it's marked is I have all of this stuff. Now you may not necessarily be able to say, oh, what is that? Because it's really low quality um, imagery. However, you know your property. So you know where <clears throat> things are. And in this particular case, I know that not only can I see it from the um, imagery from the satellite, I also know the property. And so I know that there's trees in all of these green areas, trees and tree shadows from the, I can see from the imagery. So clearly we're not going to be putting a garden anywhere in these areas. That would just not um, be productive. So we have a couple of spaces that are not marked in here. Um, we have here, we have here, and we have here. So the next step is to say, okay, those are possibilities. These are three potential options for siting a garden on this property. And so the most logical thing would be, um, you've got these options. So then you have to go out, you need to ground truth these sites, okay? So go to these sites at 10 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., ideally the same day, and it would be three times in the year, right? April 21st, which is the, you know, um, spring solstice, then June 21st and September 21st. This is an ideal scenario, but not all of us have this much time or patience um, to do that. We want to put it in. So um, what we can do is actually, you can get this down to June 21st and September 21st, because in April 21st, very often the trees are not leafed out or they're just starting to leaf out. So you can actually get more sun in the spring in certain locations than you um, might in the fall. 
even though it's the same location, it's simply a function of the trees. So you go out to these locations and you look to see how much sun is, when the sun is there. Is it you know, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. or whatever? And then you can calculate the number of hours that you have in the locations. And so your best scenario is eight to 10 hours, fantastic. That's a great site, potential site. Six hours, good. Five hours, maybe, maybe, depends what you wanna grow. And then less than five hours is definitely a no-go. It's not gonna work, you're gonna have to find another location. So my next rule for designing is to design for your space, your comfort, and your lifestyle. And that last one is a definitely big one. So in terms of lifestyle and comfort, et cetera, you have traditional in-ground beds, or perhaps you don't wanna lean over so far and you can have a raised bed scenario, or maybe, you don't want to lean over at all, or you're growing in, you know, on a patio, or in this particular case on the left, it's growing on a roof top. Um, so then in that case, you might want to use pots, troughs, bins, and that photo, a bathtub. And that was a rooftop garden in India. Actually, it's a, it's a fun photo. That's why I always include it. Um, or there's grow bags, grow bags here on the right. Grow bags. Um, you can kind of see how they're slumping a little bit and they, they don't have the structure that other um, more rigid products have, but they do have some good qualities about them um, that make them really useful. And so grow bags have been becoming very popular, let's put it that way. And their cost relative to more solid structures is pretty attractive for a lot of people. So the grow bags are a good option for people. So then the next rule that I go with is really have to um, use some vegetable garden design rules of thumbs. So what are these? These are rules that um, we use to determine the best design for the available space. So these are general and you're going to have to look at your site and to determine what works for you. And if you're using these, these hold regardless if you're using raised beds or in-ground beds. So when it comes to vegetable beds, on, in general, two to four feet wide would be the length that I would use. And your length is gonna be based on your site. So if you have you know, 10 feet of unobstructed space, you can have a 10 foot wide bed. Um, in my community garden, I have 19 foot beds. If you're gonna have a four foot wide bed, I will caution this, is that it requires you to have a substantial reach. So four foot wide beds, unless you're a very tall person, is difficult to manage without having access on both sides. So in general, I'm a fan of three foot beds. If I am um, not, um, if I have access on both sides, and it's not just that it gives you um, easy reach, but also you can step over them pretty easily. So I'm a big fan of three foot wide beds. However, if you are growing along a fence or the house, or you only have one side of access, then I am much more inclined to use two to two and a half foot wide beds. Again, if you're a tall person, you can push these numbers a little bit, but if you're not a tall person and your reach is only so much, it's really gonna be a lot more comfortable to have a two foot bed along uh, if you've got single side access. If you have a trellis bed, so you've got you know, vertical growing spaces like you see in these photos, then I prefer one and a half to two foot wide, wide beds. And the reason is this, it is um, when you have trellis to vegetables, I find that they don't play nicely with others so well. And it doesn't give me as much flexibility as if um, when I have say a four foot wide bed and half of it is trellis and half of it is low. Um, I find that the trellis plants often don't behave well with non-trellis things. 
And depending on the, the way the, um, the orientation of the bed itself, the um, trellis beds, the trellis side of the bed could cause shade onto the, your untrellis side. So I much prefer to keep trellis beds separate from um, sort of the low growing flatter beds. And so in which case I prefer a, a one and a half to two foot wide bed. Um, if you're growing in a scenario where you don't have a whole lot of choice and you need to split your bed like that, just keep in mind that your orientation is going to affect how you're growing. So just keep that in mind. And then if you are growing in trellises, like in this picture shows, there's many trellises in this garden, five to six feet between trellises. So horizontally across the beds so that you give enough space for the sun to um, go around between the different beds and um, not allow one trellis to cast shade on the others. So garden paths, this is also going to depend on your space, honestly, your foot size, um, and how low you have to um, go down to reach your beds. In general, I like an 18 inch bed, I mean, an inch, 18 inch path, but up to 24 inches. If you're going to put a wheelbarrow down the path, then you need 24 inches. If you have other carts and things, it comes down to the, um, the width of your um, axle on the cart that you're using that will help you know if you can push those at all. Um, 18 inches, 18 inch wide paths are very comfortable. I find 14 inch paths to be a little too narrow and not so comfortable if you're leaning down and you've got you know, a lot of vegetables growing, you may find yourself um, competing with your vegetables not to crush them as you lean down to pick things or um, weed or something. So I like 18 inch baths at a minimum and 24 if you've got plenty of space. And surfaces for paths, I'm a huge fan of the wood chips, the free arborist um, you know, waste product of wood chips. Um, alternatively, stone, small pea gravel type of things work well. And grass, grass paths also work, but if you are gonna use grass paths, I urge you or suggest that you consider some sort of metal edge on your bed itself to uh, help prevent um, incursion of the grass growing into your beds. Um, or if you have a raised bed, like shown here in the very front of the photo, um, but if you've got grass paths around it, you're gonna probably be taking a weed whacker in there. So in that case, you might want a metal strip also at the bottom of that bed, just to help prevent damage on your wood. Wood itself is so expensive. It's, um, you know, has a finite timeline on it. So anything to help protect it, to let and help it stay a little longer, I find is um, helpful. So I consider metal edges to be a good product if you're gonna have grass in the scenario. So in-ground beds and paths, what does that look like? What I've been talking about here. So um, down here in this image, I've got you know an 18 inches of path and then a trellis bed that's 18 inches because again, I, I only have, I'm only growing on the trellis. Then I've got another path of 18 inches and then I've got a three foot wide, 36 inch bed. And then I've got wood chips on the other side. This is an example. And in this particular one, um, what I'm showing is, is that to raise your beds a bit, which helps with drainage, especially if you've got heavy clay soils, um, to raise your beds, you can dig out the area where you're gonna put your wood chips, put it up to, you know, mound up your soil, and then you can fill in that space with the wood chips. And that does two things. First, it gives you um, support for this mounded soil so that it doesn't just sag back down into the paths. And then second, it gives you actually a reservoir to hold water. And that's also really good for drainage. So particularly on clay soils, having some place for that water that's gonna run off the beds to go into that'll be absorbed. It's a, it's a great place. 
And then that wood chip holds that moisture and it helps it infiltrate into the soil. If we get a sudden downpour, those wood chips are not only protecting the soil of the path that you're walking on, which can, you know, can get a little compacted, that wood chip helps hold the soil in place and the erosion will be less. I'm not saying it's, it's depending on your slope, depending on the heaviness of the rain, um, may not be a perfect thing. You may find some washout, but in general, um, I've had great success with wood chips for um, a raised bed planting scenario. So if you're gonna do raised beds and raised beds are also great. I, you know, they're, they're definitely a higher cost product, but in, in some scenarios, they really are the best way to go. If you're gardening under a tree, like this one shows, um, raised beds are really needed because the trees are going to have the tree roots on the surface. And so you need that extra soil volume. Um, the tree roots may and time come to the bed and invade it. You can line them um, with non-woven material, um, landscape fabric, non-woven though, don't use woven. And that can help hold off those tree roots. If they do invade, they're typically the smaller feeder roots. And you just, you'll have to just chop them out. Um, but in general, raised um, beds are really fantastic when you've got this tree scenario. And certain trees are more greedy and more likely to go after the water than others. Um, so it's raising it up is, is a good scenario. Um, 10 inches to 18 inches is typical, depends on your budget and your desire. If you are trying to um, not have rabbit fencing, say you don't have anything except rabbits, things that are gonna go for it, um, 24 inches is required. So the top of the bed has to be 24 inches high to stop a rabbit from being able to hop into it. On the other hand, if you are trying to provide something that's accessible, um, for those who may have some mobility issues, then you need to 24, uh, sorry, 28 to 34 inch height on the beds to meet ADA requirements. So we've heard about where to garden in the sun. We've heard about the types of gardening we can choose in terms of the beds themselves in the ground, containers, et cetera. And then we've heard about rules of thumbs and how to create these beds. But there's lots of other environmental factors that we need to consider in designing the garden and, um, or, and or redesigning the garden. So bed, growing bed orientation, as I mentioned before about the changing location of the sun throughout the year. The direction that the sun, um, that the bed should be oriented relative to the sun, the ideal, is to have a north-south orientation, which I've got down here in the little graphic here. So you can see my little beds here. However, it isn't always possible, perhaps due to other considerations like slope, et cetera. And if you have to orient them in the other direction from east to west, then you definitely wanna put your trellises and or tall plants to the north on the beds so that they don't block out and cause shade to the other um, beds. Another possibility is if you've got limited space, grow vertical. It really can increase the size and um, the growing space that you have. Um, but in addition to that, it keeps your crops clean. Um, these melons here are a perfect example of that very, very clean. If they're on the ground, they're more likely to have damage. Um, that's not to say that they're never gotten to with um, critters or other insects, but they um, definitely have a much better chance of coming to full maturity if they're up off of the ground. And the trellises can be used on many crops. And some examples are peas, but not the bush varieties, pole beans, uh, squashes, the vining varieties only. Um, bush varieties don't trellis very happily. 
I suppose some people do do it and, and can manage to get them to deal with it, but it, I, there, it's not my experience that they handle it very well. Um, melons, as you see from this one, and then tomatoes. Tomatoes can be staked or trellised. So then another environmental concern, which I've alluded to, and that is security and animal product, uh, protection. Um, so deer fencing should be six to seven feet high. Eight feet, if you really are, an, um, if you've got a lot of space inside of your garden, then you really do need eight feet. But if you've got a tight garden like this one that's shown in the bottom picture, where you've got tightly spaced beds and there doesn't seem to be any landing spaces, my experience has been that six to seven feet, typically they won't try it. And in terms of what to use for deer fencing, if you've got high deer pressure and you find that the um, deer are regularly going through the area where you're putting that garden, then you're going to need a really sturdy situation and sturdy fencing situation because they will they will go right through it because they've used to walking there and suddenly there is something there and so they won't necessarily see it and they'll just mow right through it. Um, so you would need you know good solid sturdy deer fencing with a top support line wire or bar. But if it's not a space where they're used to being, say, for example, this front yard, maybe they never even came through it, but now they've found it. So in that case, you can get away with lightweight stuff, mesh, et cetera, because it's really more of a visual barrier to them than it is an actual physical barrier. Yes, they could knock down these, you know, this is probably very lightweight bird netting or some other type of mesh um, and pretty not so significant, um, you know, metal poles here. However, it's enough to stop them, to deter them. Um, if they pushed on it, yeah, they're gonna get it over, but we're showing them a visual barrier and it's typically enough to stop them as long as they've not been through that area as a regular course of their habit. And then you can get away with it. Um, other issues is the critters. Small things that like to dig, um, rabbits, um, other chipmunks, groundhogs are so, so, so persistent and difficult. Um, but the best way with rabbits and groundhogs, et cetera, as you can see down here, and I've got my small critter fence um, on this detail here on the right, um, We've got, you know, a fence here, but then what I have separately is a, um, is there another color? I've got inside, or you could do it outside, which is what this one on the left has. So they've got reinforcement, it needs to come up about two feet, and then it needs to go fanned out in that direction because when they go to dig, they're gonna go straight down and then they're gonna hit that fence and then they'll stop. If you went straight down, they'll just go around it. So you need to fan it out so that they don't dig through. Um, this typically works. There are of course scenarios where you've got really very persistent and determined um, animals and um, you have to just keep trying on uh, how to keep them away. So other concerns, the sloped site. And you know, the world is not flat. We all know that. Um, and even when we start to put in a garden, we think, oh, it's a relatively flat space. Mm, doesn't always seem that way until you start digging and putting things in. So this is an example of a sloped garden. This had a 5% grade. So it dropped about six inches over the 10 feet, was about 10 feet wide. And, um, I know the numbers because I designed it, but in addition to that, looking at the fence here on the back, we see the level line is green. And the sign, 
I looked at the fence and the fence itself, you can see that there's some angling going off there. So there's a big old tip off that you've got a good slope on it. And so that pre-construction slope was what the fence was put in at. So then in this particular case, we have uh, about less than ideal, but it was a really tight squeeze. So I've got 18 inches space down in here, down in there, it's a little less because it's, it's an angle. And this, this, this happens with um, properties sometimes. So it's about 14 inches down at the very end. Um, but we put in three levels of beds and they're all, you can see from the yellow line, they're, they're sloping down. So um, this had a 12%. Yeah, this had a 12%. So anything that's more than 5% really, think about terracing it. Um, and it doesn't always have to be raised beds, but you do need something to support the, the downhill side of the bed itself. And that can be vegetative, it can be wood, it can be brick, etc. But we definitely need some support on the downside. And then another very significant issue, particularly right around our houses, is stormwater runoff. So we've got stormwater runoff from multiple locations. And I like this photo because it shows, not only do I have downspouts from the house, I, you can see the one here in the distance, but this is the, the downspout pan here where it's, it's the spillway coming out. So I've got water, the one that's coming out beyond the garden, I didn't have to worry about because that actually had an underground drain, but this one in the front was not underground and it, was coming this way. And so the garden itself needed to have the slope adjusted so that it drained in the direction toward the front here of the gate because there was only a small space in the back and I didn't want the, the water running through the garden like that. So I have it all draining toward this area. And as far as the downspout goes, that one to make sure it did not go back up into the garden. That one um, got put underground with a little uh, downspout underground extension. So other stormwater troubleshooting. All right, so does the site have a low spot where, or is there a place where there's water collecting? And if you have a low spot and water collecting, you can add soil to try and bring up the grade, or you can raise the beds. And this particular photo here on the right, um, I've marked where the, the backyard was higher and it's coming forward to the street. And you can see that there's a lot of water being drained off this property. We've got two underground drains here. And then we've got surface water coming off of the backyard as well. So this um, garden, this is not one that I designed. This is one I've seen in the neighborhood. And they chose to raise it up um, on to uh, put it in a raised bed to try and keep that water to go around it. Um, so really want to look where the water is going. The easiest time to do it, it's very inconvenient because you're gonna get wet, take an umbrella, but the best time, and as landscape architects, the best time to see where the water's going is in the rain. And so especially a heavy one. Um, so you need to plan to divert stormwater off, um, not only within your garden, how it's going to drain into a garden, but also to make sure that it's not going to go into your garden from outside of the garden. And a couple things I'll note about this photo that I'm showing you here. First, you see that the garden has been located on top of an existing underground drain pipe. That is fine scenario providing that doesn't get clogged, it doesn't get blocked. And it's not that long, or if it did, it could be rotted out, et cetera, from there. But it's, it's, it's something to keep in mind that this was, would not be my preference as to where to put it. I would have sighted it closer to the sidewalk so that it was sitting between those two. So that if anything ever had to happen to pull up that drain pipe, that the garden wouldn't have to be impacted by it. Um, the other note I will say about this particular garden is, um, I, I see this very often that PVC is used as like a, a cage or a trellising method, both, I've seen them for both. 
And PVC um, pipe, no matter the diameter, is just a little too flexible for any sort of trellising or animal um, exclusion. And they sell, you see these all the time on the internet, and they sell, sell all sorts of adapters to try and put these things together. And what you're seeing here is what I have seen, um, not just in this garden, but in many places, and it's just not rigid enough for our purposes. Um, if you wanted to pursue something like this, and you felt that you know putting some sort of netting, and this was just bird netting that they had, I would go for a half inch EMT and use the plumbing uh, fittings. They, it's much more rigid um, and it, it lasts a lot longer anyway. And so I would definitely go for the half inch PVC, um, half inch EMT piping. So other environmental considerations about where you're gonna put your garden or how you're gonna design it is, um, water source, how far are you from the hose bib? If it is a long run to the hose bib, it's gonna be really rough to keep it um, watered on a regular basis. Um, the other thing that I have you know, really started to think carefully about, and that is using drip irrigation. Drip irrigation, there are very simple low-tech um, systems that you can buy. In our area, for the most part, you do not need to do anything special for the lines in the winter. I'm not sure if that holds way up in the mountains for Maryland, but um, for lower areas, lower elevations, we can get away with just simply taking in the unit um, in the winter. So the timer and the backfill preventer and all those things, just bring it into the house in the winter and then bring it back out in the um, spring. And um, we don't need to drain the lines or anything like that because we just don't have that um, freeze thaw, at least not in lower elevations. I would definitely, I would, um, I would consult cooperative extension on that one about uh, the higher elevations as to uh, whether or not you need to, to take drain your lines off for the winter. Other things to consider are heat sources. So are you going to get heat from your house or retaining walls, street, driveway, sidewalks? They act as a sink of the um, solar radiation so that heat will be absorbed into the brick and is given off. So what it means in the growing season is that you may need to water more frequently because they're going to things are going to dry out faster in those locations. What I will say though, after having a surprise um, light frost yesterday, I think or two days ago, is that that uh, sink of um, brick walls can provide some extra protection from the light frost and um, nothing was damaged as a result of that. So that was it's so there's pros and cons to having the the solid surfaces um, depending on the season, but it definitely is something to consider um, in the growing season, especially in the summer in terms of water. Um, and you know lead and heavy metals. If you are starting a garden for the first time, if you're an existing gardener, you've probably already checked it, but if you're starting a garden for the first time, if it's near structures or if it's in an urban environment in particular, um, I strongly recommend that you just have a, a soil sample test done. They're pretty inexpensive. There's a list there. Um, Cooperative Extension has a list of soil um, labs, testing labs that are available in the country. Um, so you can go and send out your sample. The other positive thing about having a soil sample done is that then they will also um, give you some uh, profile of what your nutrients and your pH and all the other um, actionable items in terms of your soil condition. So um, it's twofold. So you can take care of that potential environmental concern, but then you can also get some action um, you know, list in terms of dealing with um, improving your soil. And in the end, if particularly with environmental concerns, lead, um, stormwater, et cetera, I would encourage you to get professional help, especially on um, the heavy metals concerns. Um, those, it's, it's well worth it, particularly since this is something that you are growing to eat um, and you want to be very, you know, 
careful about certain conditions and uh, you want to make sure that you're you're doing giving yourself the best um, health healthy product possible and um, not causing yourself any um, long-term harm from that. So designs, tips, four tips. Let's look at some designs. Um, this will be an opportunity for us to think about garden design from a designing perspective based on the rules that we've all seen here, the four rules that I presented. So here is a sample layout of a, a 25 by 25 foot bed, a community garden. Um, and I did give this, um, use this as part of a presentation to the community, one of to the community garden that I'm in. And so this was about maximizing space um, so that there can be a combination of trellises, some storage area, and a bed. Um, you'll note that the beds mostly run north to south, and that there's one bed, though, that runs east to west. And the reason that that bed was run east to west is because the path, which is to the, the outside of that, the left bit, is actually higher. So there's a bit of a slope here. So it's higher, and that um, bed was put in that direction to help hold the path up and to keep the water from running through for the path. Um, and so that, that was the reason for um, running it in that direction. Otherwise, if it were a flatter location, then those um, beds two, three, four, and five could have gone all the way to the path without any problem. Um, so this is a super, um, super efficient um, type of design. We've got three beds, two, four, and six. And then we've got three trellises, three, five, and seven, uh, number one being the oddball. But the reason I say it's super efficient is because we're alternating the low ground beds with the higher trellises beds. And then we have three separate beds. So we can actually rotate plants, um, different plant families through this. So we have a three-year rotation possible for the trellises and a three-year rotation possible for the, the flatter beds. So for example, a three-year rotation on the trellises could be um, legumes, peas, or beans um, on one trellis. Another trellis could be squashes, and maybe the third trellis could be um, tomatoes, for example. And then on two, four, and six, you choose other families to rotate through there. So um, those are the benefits of that particular one. The, the problem with this design though, I will say is that it is very difficult because the walkway pathways are on both sides all the way around and they go all the way to the edge. So you, this particular layout is not great for fencing if one had to do a, like a critter fence or something like that. So this is another alternative that has a possibility for fencing. So if a fence were run around the perimeter there, you've got um, very small beds along the fence, so um, 18 inches, foot and a half. And all those perimeter beds, if the fencing is simply for growing space, they could all be trellises. Um, if it's fencing for critters, then you wouldn't grow um, using them as trellises, you might narrow up the bed to being only, you know, six inches, shift your, shift your paths over, and then you could increase the beds to four, five, six, and seven to take up the space. Um, so that would depend on what you were doing it. Um, the con of this is, if you were, just say it's not critters that you're concerned about, but you're using fencing, you're just fencing it for space and having vertical growing space. Um, the con of this particular design is that you actually have very, fairly limited um, flat growing space. So there is a clear preference in this particular design that you're gonna be doing a lot of, of trellising of um, squashes, for example, and um, other you know, beans and such like that. Um, with that said, 
in my community garden, I will say that this is a very popular um, style to design um, beds or their, their garden plots because of that. And as is allowed by the use of uh, rules of use terms, um, every square inch is covered in squashes and such and rotated through the year. So it's really fun to look at. And the production is wild, wild in the amount they can get out of this garden. So let's look at another example here. Um, this is uh, someone in the neighborhood um, took a photo of their beds, uh, um, of their garden, and just want to run you through a little critique on it. So, okay. Um, this picture we're looking at, I'm standing at the house where uh, I took the photo. And the far end is the north side of the garden, the house is the south side. Okay, so the beds have a north-south orientation. That's great, we heard that's ideal. The trellis is at the north side. So that's what that, it's probably a hog panel that's been used as a trellis there. And the beds are four, four feet by eight feet. Four feet, not my cup of tea personally, but it's perfectly fine because there's access on both sides. So that seems to work very well for the, the um, homeowner. Um, there is an 18 inch central pathway down the middle. So there's plenty of space to get through there. There's also a slight slope toward the street. So the house is, is one we expect a little higher than the street. So the water can drain away from the house. So this um, has with having this central access path down the middle and having this north south orientation, we're allowing the water to flow down to the street. So that's great. Um, one thing that I will say though about this particular garden and how it's located. And this is really for this property, this is the most efficient layout. And I, you know, I, I, I think that these people have done a fantastic job of um, creating their garden and working their garden, et cetera. The, I'm, my only critique, and it is not about them, it is just a fact, and that is the two beds that are closest to us in this picture, as you can see from this, because this picture was taken in the morning about 10 o'clock, and it's fall. Um, in the fall and spring, and especially in the winter, you can see <coughs> that it's in the shade. So those beds that are closest to us in this picture are gonna have very limited production in the um, shoulder season and in the winter, because they're just being shaded by the house. So that's just a reality of the site. You can work with that. Um, what it would mean if you wanted to do any winter gardening is to focus on those beds closer to the street. It might also mean that in the winter, you may, you know, depending on how that trellis was put in there, um, if the trellis is to the insides of the beds, you can work around the outsides of them to try and maximize because you won't be growing anything on a trellis in the winter. Um, so so that is that is um, something to consider in this particular one. So is it time to redesign your garden or reevaluate it or design it if you have one? Um, I put together a little short exercise for you to be able to do um, a little evaluation of your own. And in this exercise, I've got most of the common things that you would find in a garden. So I've got a fence, if you've got it, rain barrel, compost bins of different sizes, wheelbarrow, trash can, chairs, etc. cetera. Um, but I also have at the very top, I have fencing, I have beds of different sizes. And the beds themselves are 10 feet. They're, so it's 10 feet from here to here. But this here in the center is five foot. So everything is to scale. And at the bottom here, I have trellises with uh, 18 inch wide beds or foot and a half wide beds. And then two foot beds here as well. So everything is to scale on here because we have this to scale. This is a um, block 
a 25 by 25 foot block. And the task here is to take the items that are on here to design the garden. And because they're all to scale, if you were to have this on a piece of paper, and if you, I'll, I'll put it up in the chat at the end, um, you can get this exercise yourself to do. Um, but we're gonna run through an exercise of one that you just put together for it. And so in this particular exercise, I assumed that I had a 25 by 25 foot community garden plot and how was I gonna redesign it? But you can do this exercise at home with whatever the size is of your total garden. So you can put in your beds and do it. But we're gonna do this as a 25 by 25 foot, um, 625 square foot community garden spot. And so this was an example. How would I arrange this? And I wanted to have a combination of trellises. I wanted to have some beds. I wanted some storage space. I wanted a place to put my chair and rain barrel and wheelbarrow, et cetera. So you, cause you have to store everything in your plot. If you're in a community garden, if you're out there and you know it. Um, and so what are some, what are some things about this? Um, well, first remember these were plots. These um, squares are one foot. So we have in this particular spot, I have a two foot wide, let me draw here. I've got two foot beds here, or sorry, two foot path here. I've got a four foot wide bed. You know, I'm not a big fan of that, but there's due to space. I got another two foot path here and I've got about an 18 inch path here, this is 18. And here I've got another 18 inch path. And here too, all the way down. Not bad, not bad at all. And I've got some trellises right here and here. I've got some trellises. I don't know that I'd consider this to be the best, um, but it's certainly a good start. Um, what I would probably do is say, okay, um, how can I, I only have two trellises here. I like a three-year rotation. So maybe I'll throw this bed out here. Throw this bed out here, put in a trellis and see what I get there. Mm, put a bed there, there. Can I get two in? Maybe I can. Maybe I can get two trellises in here. Well, that's not wide enough, but there. Maybe I can get two trellises in here, make them even wider. So you get the idea here. A trellis there. So this is the general idea of, of um, being able to have it in blocks, with blocks, and then being able to put it on a grid and to work out the best way to um, design your garden. This is really um, iterative. It's a process. It's going to take you several tries. It's iterative. We like to say in design. Design is always iterative. Um, so keep trying until you feel you've got all the growing beds that you need for your purposes. And it's going to really depend on your site. It's really going to depend on your growing needs and how much space you want to manage. It's going to depend on your furnishings. If you have to get furnishings in there, such as a compost bin or rain barrel, pool storage, wherever, depending on where you're gardening at, and then get your pathways in there. So patience is rewarded with easier growing and more production. And it's really, it, it's, it's, I'm utterly biased. It's fun to design, um, but it's even more fantastic when you've seen that design come to reality and then you realize how much easier and how much more efficient your layout is and your production is higher, still in the same amount of space. So it's, it's well worth it. It is a little bit of time to try your design, but it's a lot easier to design on a piece of paper than it is to keep shoveling around the soil in your garden. So I think you've got this and these are the pictures of my nephews. They were so happy with that Napa cabbage. 
um, that my sister grew. And uh, you've got this. So I, I'd like to say happy growing to everyone. And awesome. That, that so at the awesome. end here, I've got, so as Stephanie mentioned, I've got a short survey um, to find out how you thought of this um, talk. And, and then I'm gonna give you that um, exercise that you saw with the, the CAD blocks and the um, uh, graph paper so you can do your own garden. And then also when I've given talks of this nature, I get tons and tons of questions and asking about my favorite educational resources, seed and supplies information. Mm -hmm. So I've got two cheat sheets, one for each, one's for education and one's for seed and supplies. So that is what is coming to you if you were so kindly will fill out my quick little survey at the end. And there's my contact information and I am all ears for questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Sherry. And yes, folks, I did already go ahead and put the link to the survey in the chat. And I will say it is very brief and the resources are well worth it. So I highly recommend grabbing that link before you head out from the presentation for today. But we are going to go ahead and do the Q&A right now. Um, so Sherry, we got a lot of questions about materials for raised beds um, yep. and if you have preferences for that. And honestly, we get a lot of those questions pretty much on all of our food gardening talks. So we'll go through those, but I just wanted to say up front, um, I am going to put a link into the chat from the Home and Garden Information Center website. And it's a whole page about raised bed materials um, and what's safe and what's been questionable, what we use now, that kind of thing. So before we get to these, I did just want to say, folks, that is in the chat for you at this point. Okay, so getting into those questions, the first one is, why did you prefer wood beds to metal or plastic? So that's a great question. And I have to say that, you know, where to go with that one? I'm yeah <laughs> where to go with that one all right so there's pros and cons to everything i you know in the old days i would say okay um wood is preferable because it does although it degrades over time um you know the what is applied to it is perhaps better well known um however in the last two three years the price of wood has gone through the roof so mm -hmm. everyone is looking for alternatives and alternatives I've seen as like the, the um, animal troughs that people are using. There's all sorts of different raised metal beds that I see are coming online. Mm -hmm. And then I've even um, seen that one photo showed, um, which was new to me, is a new product that's a plastic based, although they've been around for quite some time, that particular mm -hmm um company was guaranteeing for 15 years and i have to say from when i've used other plastic tubs etc mm -hmm. i want to see 15 years out of it out of a plastic product i just i i'm not sure i i believe that's the case i can't mm -hmm. the sun is just so brutal but i'm not sure what they're treated with so i can only speak to the wood products because it's easier to know what's going to be the environmental impact on them the metal or and or plastic products beyond a flower pot or a plastic tub well even those maybe um i'm going to defer to cooperative extension i'm sorry <laughs> stuff you to dump it on you but i'm gonna i i just don't feel that the that there's as much performance um information out there yet mm -hmm. and i think that the because of the price of wood we're being pushed Lots of people are being pushed to using these other things. And so right. I feel like that's coming forward in time. Sure. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and I guess maybe the next question is also super similar. Thoughts on metal raised beds, such as the Vigo Garden raised bed? So I'm not so familiar with those. Um, I guess, you know, like um, animal troughs, they've got a zinc coating on them. Um, obviously if they're rated for animal water usage, they must be considered safe enough for an animal to drink from. That's going to then ultimately be, um, meat product that we consume. So I would hope that that is, um, 
a high enough quality, but there are different standards for what is mm -hmm. for human consumption and what it is for animal consumption out there in the marketplace. So I would suggest taking a look at any coatings are on it or other um, things. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll defer to cooperative extension on this one. Ultimately, when it comes to the metal beds, I'm only really, you know, more experienced and knowledgeable about the wood ones at this point. Yeah. Um, and are there any reasons, and you mentioned a few already, for using one material over another to make your raised bed? Price. And of course, aesthetics. Aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Some people just want a particular look, especially if they have a very small yard or a small patio, and they simply, <clears throat> they already have an, some particular design aesthetic to their yard, and mm -hmm. they want it to blend in or match. Yeah. Got it. And I will say this though, about if you do something like a animal trough and it's this, um, you know, shiny metal beds, they do heat up in the summer. Mm -hmm. So do keep in mind that if you're going to plan on that, you need to lean on them or you want to, you know, sort of, um, you know, touch them or whatever that in the middle of the day, they, they will heat up. So that is Definitely. something to keep in mind. Yeah. yeah it's a great point. Okay, so when talking about growing in raised beds, how would you arrange vertical growing if you're using a raised bed? So in a raised bed, it depends on if you have a bottom to it. If mm -hmm. you have a bottom to it, then you're going to be really limited in terms of how much um, vertical support you can get for the raised bed. Um, you might be able to attach the um, trellis to the back of it or the sides of it that might mm -hmm. help you. You're going to have to look at how strong your um, vertical supports are and if you have a top support. Um, I will say this, though. If you've got a really solid um, top support for a trellis, mm -hmm. even if you just use nylon mesh netting, it's pretty darn strong. I mean, you're not going to grow pumpkins on there that are 25 mm -hmm. pounds. That's not going to hold. But you can pretty well hold some, you know, really big, um, melons or, um, you know, like, uh, butternut squashes, et cetera, you know, like three, four, five pounds, maybe even on mm -hmm. some of those trellises, they will hold. Um, they're not going to last forever because they're mm -hmm. either they're nylon or they're just, um, um, plastic mesh, but they will hold. So it doesn't have to be the most rigid material for a trellising. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, so the next question is, do you use a software program to design your garden, such as the one in this presentation? And if so, what do you use? I know you mentioned AutoCAD, but is there anything else you wanted to mention? Yeah, so I used AutoCAD because I have it. Um, but that said, <clears throat> it's not the most friendly thing on this planet. <clears throat> and um, honestly, the the biggest thing you need is to keep things in scale. And mm -hmm. the most low tech thing ever is to simply go buy graph paper mm -hmm. and they're usually quarter inch, um, uh, spacing on them. You they're smaller, but a quarter inch is plenty depending on how big your garden is. And you can simply draw things out from there. Yeah. Um, that exercise, if you fill up a little survey, which by the way, is only two questions. Um, and then an open-handed feedback thing. But if you fill out that survey, you can take that on a copy machine, get that down to the right size mm -hmm. so that you can use your own graph paper or use the one that I gave you and you can do that. That to me, software is fantastic in some ways, but is it necessary? No way. <laughs> right. No way. All right, so how much space do you need if you want to grow blueberries or raspberries or strawberries? So all of these creatures have mm -hmm. very different growth habits. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, blueberries, I will say, tend to be a challenge and that is more about soil preparation. Mm -hmm. They really want to be in organic material. So um, I have spoken with um, nurserymen about this and they recommend 50% um, peat and 50% wood chip or one year, 100% wood chip, one year aged, 100% wood chip. Mm -hmm. So in terms of growing a blueberry, um, the minimum is about a, a four foot 
diameter circle around it. Five is ideal, but four is plenty, I think. And then um, you, putting them next to each other. Mm -hmm. they, if you've got rabbits, you need some protection on those roots. <laughs> they're going to chew them up. You will not see any new growth in your blueberries because um, the rabbits will go after them. And if you've got birds, oh, wait, we all have birds. So um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I recommend you plant more blueberries than you think you need. Unless you're <laughs> planning to defend them with your life with a cage because um, they are the birds are very happy to help themselves to mm -hmm. just the slightest bit of, um, of um, blueberries that are ripening. Raspberries, on the other hand, they need trellising to keep them tidy and organized. So you can use like a T-post and some sort of a cross beam, or you can use a couple of T-posts, but they need about, well, raspberries, they will sucker out, they'll creep out on you, they'll tip root. So if the cane touches the ground, it's going to, it's going to root. So if you keep them in a trellised area, you can keep them upright and they won't tip root on you, which is good. Creeping out, they're still going to do that. So ideally you've got access in all the way around your raspberry bed. So mm -hmm. be kind to your neighbor. Don't plant that thing on a fence. If you are <laughs> going to plant it on a fence, <laughs> be kind to your neighbor and put a root barrier down <laughs> of some sort about 12 inches down. Mm -hmm. um, or you're might have a conversation with your neighbor that won't be so pleasant um so that that's for for raspberries but i would do you know like two feet wide probably two feet wide the depth of the bed and mm -hmm. the length of whatever you want and the spacing on raspberries Sorry. you'll have to look that up i can't remember that one off the top of my head got and it the last one was strawberries the last one was strawberries yep strawberries <clears throat> don't put them in a raised bed because the soil level in a raised bed will continue to fall over time so you're going to need to keep your transplanting and they don't like that. Um, the other thing I find with raspberries, uh, not raspberries, strawberries, is that they're ill-behaved in a raised bed anyway. They want to run out. So <laughs> they're just not well-behaved. I say they're not fit for the city, quite honestly. <laughs> I have mine in a community garden because then they can take over and that's fine. So the spacing on them is eight, eight inches to 12 inches in all directions. Um, Good solid organic material, but mm -hmm. no no particular pH. Just go to the cooperative extension. Maryland's got some great stuff on there. Not that I'm giving a plug here, Stephanie. You've got great research on varieties that work well for us, and I think that that's mm -hmm. um, good. Um, I don't remember if that includes any ever bearing. I'm a big June bearing um, mm -hmm. person, but people have success with ever bearing, and um, I guess C C C C C. -C Oh, I don't know the variety. I can't remember. It starts with a C as an S E A. Um, that's a good one for this area. It works pretty well. Um, but definitely don't put it in a raised bed. Give it a good space. Um, sure. I would go with that rule of thumb about, you know, three feet, no more than wider than three feet. Perfect. And John, if you had anything to add, you can add it into the chat too. Okay, so the last one, I think this is a really good question. Do you mix annuals and perennials in your vegetable garden? If so, how does this affect the rotation practice? Yeah, I do not mix them. Um, and it's for that very reason is that um, it's hard to um, rotate. But on top of that, the perennials have very specific growing requirements and nutritional requirements. And annuals, I would say there's more just general, you know, good nutrient practices, um, organic compost, et cetera. Whereas when we're talking perennials, we might be talking asparagus, um, fruit, small berry production, um, herbs, et cetera. And they all have different growing requirements. So for example, it might be a really nice idea to have an herb bed where you've got, you know, rosemary and thyme, but then you want to have some lettuce in there. But you do you have to realize that um, these herbs, many of the herbs that we have, so thyme and rosemary and um, lavender and, you know, sage, they're Mediterranean plants. They don't like a lot of water. If you start watering them the amount that a lettuce is going to want, they're going to keel over on you or they're going to have a lot of um, fungus on them. Um, and so you, if you're going to have a perennial area, choose plants that are going to like that particular growing condition. So mm -hmm. in general, I keep 
um, herbs separate. I will mix herbs with plants that are very low water requiring. Um, that's perfectly fine, mm -hmm. um, but not with my um, annual vegetable production. It's not um, the water. The water dictates that more than well. That and rotation probably is the reason I don't mix them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, great. So that was all of the questions that we have in our Q and A. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and repost the survey link um, for Sherry's very brief evaluation. And once you complete it, you'll automatically receive the resources that she has put together for today's presentation. So with that, I'd like to say thank you so much to Sherry for presenting for us. That was wonderful and eye-opening, and we really appreciate you taking all the time to answer all of our questions for us. You're most welcome. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to everyone for joining us. As I mentioned, this recording will be available on the UME HGIC YouTube channel, as well as the Master Gardener Continuing Education page.